All right, welcome. Thank you, Heather. On behalf of CAFE Research Services and the Office of Sustainability, I'd like to welcome you to our session. So thanks for coming to the Urban Spaces Faculty Panel. Uh, I'm really excited about this panel. I think it's going to be a really engaging session and uh, it's going to showcase the impressive scholarly and creative work of five faculty members from a wide variety uh, of areas at McKinney, so that's really great. My name is Carolyn. I'm one of the curriculum planning and development coordinators here in CAFE. And, uh, I'll be facilitating today's panel. So I'll give you a bit of background as to what the panel is about and how it came to be and all of that. A couple of years ago, uh, McEwen began awarding strategic research grants uh, for projects that advanced university priorities. Uh, this year's deadline is March 1st. So when Chantel from the Office of Sustainability contacted me and Megan Abbott in Research Services who wanted to be here today and she sends her apologies, when she contacted us to collaborate on a session featuring faculty research and creative work related to sustainability, we thought this would be a great opportunity for us to highlight the kinds of research that we would like to see coming forward for those strategic research grant applications. So uh, this year we, we opted uh, for this session to go with the thematic context of, of urban spaces. Uh, now, McEwen is positioned as a downtown university, so we are in the heart of the city, and we pride ourselves on many things. One is our, our unique student experience, another is our engagement with the community, and another, of course, is our commitment to sustainability, economic, social, and environmental sustainability. So today's panelists are going to share with you a wide range of research that exemplifies this commitment. Uh, although the research is diverse, it all fits together in the thematic context of sustainability spaces. So I'm pleased to introduce today's panelists. So we'll start at this end. We've got Lena Wong from Business, who's going to be talking about local sustainable business. Melissa Hills from Biological Sciences, who's going to be talking about her research into mustard, weed, and urban green spaces. Shahid Islam from Economics, who's going to talk about urban transportation, specifically the LRT expansion, and its impacts on urban community. And Agnieszka Mateko from Fine Art and Kathleen Quinn from Social Work are going to talk about the connection between art and social well-being, in particular through a suicide awareness project. So I'm very excited to hear the wide range of research, and I'm sure you are too. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. <laughs> so I think Kathleen uh, and Agnieszka are going to start. So whenever you're ready, we are ready. Thank you. So we're working on a collaborative project, Kathleen and I. And the project is called We Walk Together. It initially started uh, with the idea of, um, of the, the suicide prevention team on High Level Bridge, but we have since moved away a little bit from that concept, and Kathleen will explain to you why. Um, if you could click to the next slide. So our project is going to take place almost exactly in this location, just a little bit up that path and just at the entrance. And it is uh, an art installation. It's a text-based art installation, so you'll be able to actually walk on it. So, and I'll let Kathleen explain further. So uh, this is a collaboration. I met uh, Angie at a workshop and uh, I think I introduced myself and she said, good, I've been wanting to meet you. <laughs> so as a social worker, uh, I've always had uh, a strong uh, interest in, um, uh, in art and uh, using art as social transformation. Uh, uh, interested in dance, theater, uh, film, uh, writing, a uh, big part of my life, and I've seen uh, the transformation that happens through the use of art. So uh, when you approached me, it was very exciting. I thought, oh, it's just, uh, I love to bring my two worlds uh, together. Uh, as a social worker, uh, also, uh, and now being downtown, because our faculty moved downtown, uh, we've always had uh, placements in all of the inner city agencies, so all of the ones that uh, you know and or may not know Boyle Street, our community uh, neighbors, uh, Bissell, Mustard Seed, Iuman. Uh, we work very closely with um, and also on the south side with uh, other agencies. So we work with people who are homeless and uh, people who spend a lot more time on the street than you and I do. So I'm a big believer in making that street very beautiful for people. 
So this was very exciting. Uh, also, our other partners uh, were students from uh, Braemar uh, High School. Um, the teacher there, Nicole Galius. Um, Jamie Edwards, some of you may remember, I think she's, uh, I think she's retired now uh, from McCune, but was a very well-respected uh, English professor. And uh, Chris Andrzejczyk, who uh, is a social worker, also a grad, as it happens, from the Social Work Diploma Program, and he works with um, the city around community safety. And we also worked with engineers from uh, the city of Edmonton. I'm smiling because I love doing that. Because <laughs> We had to get together and write poetry together, and uh, or edit poetry. We didn't do the writing, and uh, I, it was one of my favorite uh, times. So, um, so we walked together. Um, uh, started as um, I think after the um, media paid attention to the number of suicides, I think he became very interested, and. Um, uh, they, you know, they've put a phone up. I think we have a picture of it uh, later. And there was some awareness. Do you remember when it was in the media a while ago? Anyhow, that was, I think, what started it. Um, and so we started looking at some of the research and um, uh, around uh, suicide and bridges. And uh, one of the things we learned very quickly is do not identify a bridge as a suicide bridge. And it actually increases suicide. So we looked internationally at the evidence, and uh, that may or not make not make sense to you. But you know, when a, in high school, when there's a suicide of a youth, uh, we really ask um, to be very little publicity around it, because what happens uh, is we get a copycat. Where, and so you want to keep the information and all of the attention around it to a minimum, so you don't have. Um, people who are in a very vulnerable, hopeless situation uh, following that. So, and that applied to the bridge too. So we moved from wanting it to be uh, giving a message to people who were perhaps on the bridge and uh, thinking uh, uh, in a very dark moment, and we were thinking of bringing them this light, uh, we moved away from that. So the, the, it's moved to, it's a, a beautiful message for all of us who walk across the high level bridge. And if you haven't walked over the High Level Bridge for a while, we're going to really encourage you, once our poetry is sanded in, to go look at it. <laughs> you can start with looking at the installation. So, um, uh, so uh, students at uh, Braemar School uh, wrote, uh, they were led in a reflection around poetry. Um, we did an edit on that, and then we came together uh, the group of us a couple of times to finish the poetry, but the words are from the students at Braemar School. And um, so now the aim of the installation is to create a moment of pause and reflection for pedestrians and to build a sense of community uh, among passerby. So kind of changed uh, where we were going. Um, working with uh, the city of Edmonton and uh, with the social worker, we, you know, we're on the same plane, but working with an engineer has was been very interesting with his worldview and what he brought and um, um, uh, just a, but he wants it very low key, I can't even use his name, um, <laughs> because they don't want a lot of publicity, they don't want everybody running down and putting, we have the lights now, we're going to have poetry, it's going to be great on the bridge. Here's a part of our poem. We're only going to give you a little bit because we want you to go walking when it's up and, and see it. So I listen to your tears. Just because it's raining doesn't mean you can't dance. You never know how many people care about you until you ask for help. I think of you when it rains, steady rain, just like your heartbeat. Maybe I should just add that um, these were all submitted by Braemar High School students. You may not know that Braemar is a special school for pregnant teens. And these youth are, pro you know, in my experience of going to high schools, and I've been to quite a few, it's by far the most moving school because many of these kids come from backgrounds that are like nothing I've ever experienced. And so they were asked to say something that's uplifting for their peers. So this is what they said. So these are uh, pictures of where the poetry is going to go in. 
So this were just taken on the weekend, right? Yeah, I just took them a few days ago, yeah. yeah, yeah. So just as you're entering in. Uh, and right by, this is the phone uh, that they put in for people so they can reach out to people. There's somebody at the other end of the phone call. Um, and so the poetry will be there beside that phone. I'll send blast, or we will send blast, that I listen to your tears right around the emergency phone. So the funding, of course, we want to acknowledge the funding that uh, came from McEwen. And I'll pass it over to you. Sure. These are just projects that led up to this collaboration with Kathleen. And I've been trying to get my students out of the classroom and into public spaces. So we've been doing intervention type art, and this happens to be a tape art project in um, Rutherford Library. So these are with my U of A students. And the idea of tape came to me because tape is easy to put up, it's easy to remove, it doesn't cause any damage and it can be put up in all kinds of places. You know, I, we could literally change these hallways in a space of seven hours with my students. And so they, they worked in teams and they created these works that stayed up for about a month. And this is a project with, McEw with a McEwen class. It's the U of A hospital. And it was wonderful to see people in walkers and in wheelchairs walking around the hospital, treating it like an art gallery, just walking around to see where all the art is. <laughs> Students love this. They, you know, I've never had such positive feedback. They said they felt that their art was really useful. This is more work. They're often humorous works. You know, art isn't often funny, but the idea with these intervention type artworks. Our project on the bridge is, uh, I'm hoping, will be moving and touching and uplifting. These are just downright funny, I hope. So this is what one of the students put in just at the entrance, is police officers collecting money from students walking to the library. And this is a waterfall down the staircase. <laughs> And this is another project we did together with the Stony Plain Business Association and through a City of Edmonton grant. We transformed Butler Park through art. And this is another um, installation with the Stony Plain Business Association. It's sculpture all the way down Stony Plain Road. So as you can see, the idea is that it's colorful, cheerful, accessible for people and doable and with students. We carried these by hand and in one case I got so tired carrying them with students that I hired a garbage truck and he and I drove the sculptures. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is a most recent project that I did. It's a Edmonton Arts Council Commission and these are um, poems uh, collected from residents, from poets, and from, these are chil poems written by children some, in some cases, children from the community, and they were sandblasted into sidewalks. So now you can picture what our project is going to look like on the bridge. And this is how it's done. It's, it's sandblasted and then painted um, over stencils, and then the stencils are removed. This is our as we were doing it, um, the wind kept blowing our tents away. It was really very exciting. And this is a poem written by uh, one of the pregnant teens. I've worked with this school twice now because their poetry was among the best we had submitted. And this is the final project I did. These are. Um, <coughs> This was just put up, I would say, a month ago. And it is a series of quotes collected from English as a Second Language student. Some of them we actually translated. <coughs> I'm sorry, where is this? It's the um, Ormsby Community Center. And we had a big opening with the local mosque and low, it's a very, it, the area is a low income housing community. So we had a lot of base, it's, I've never seen such an international community in my life. You know, children are playing in the front yards and they come from absolutely everywhere. 
and some of the teens who wrote for these quotes um, couldn't speak English, so the teacher had to translate for me, <laughs> uh, which I thought was fantastic. And it goes on both sides of the wall, so the whole, basically we transformed the building. And that's it. Maybe we'll try to get through them all first, if that's okay, just so we run out of time. We should have lots of time for questions. <clears throat> okay, first I will begin by apologizing that my voice is really low. Mm -hmm. uh, I just came from the other side of the globe Monday morning, so I'm still kind of jet lagged. Mm -hmm. So once in a while I may have to clear my throat or something like that. Please uh, forgive me for that. Uh, I'll be talking about my two small projects that I did uh, a couple of years ago uh, that relates to the city of Edmonton. Uh, one of them is impact of neighborhood characteristics on house prices, and the second one is impact of energy expansion on residential property values. Uh, the second one was actually financed by our McKeon Research Office. Okay. I'll go fairly briefly it's one of them. So this is the first one. Uh, the thing is that house prices vary by neighborhoods. We know that one neighborhood is larger houses, bigger houses, expensive houses, and another uh, neighborhood has relatively smaller houses, cheaper houses. And it comes from many different places. There are several theories, in fact, about that. But, uh, a rich person does not want a poor person to be in his or her neighborhood. So there are all sorts, sorts of things. Uh, my objective was primarily three. One is how the house price get impacted by adjacent graphenes. And by graphenes, I also included river valleys. The, the typical definition of ravine is something uh, which is narrower than a canyon and formed from uh, water flows like that. But we commonly understand what ravines are here in, in the city. And I also include a river valley as part of everything. So the definition is a bit broad. The second one is amount of public land. <coughs> there are also um, theories that if a particular neighborhood has more public lands, like green spaces or forest spaces or anything like that, that increases the house price. So I just wanted to see that how Edmontonians feel. And the third one is crime rates. The common um, idea is wherever more crime is house prices typically low, people don't want to buy them. So I wanted to see that because the research personally is relatively inconclusive. Uh, one can come up with, well, there are five researches this way, three is the other way, but you can't come out a completely conclusive idea um, that the neighborhood that has a larger rate of crimes, house prices are going to be low. Not necessarily always. Some places it is true, some places it is not. So I thought that I'd try to explore what actually it is here in Edmonton. So the basic model, actually in, in both the studies I used, this is the basic model. Like any house price is a function of particular characteristics. Of course, houses own characteristics. The square footage, number of rooms, so what's terms, two story, one story, garage, um, presence of air conditioning, fireplaces, all sorts of things. And also, some other neighborhood characteristics, who are actually the neighbors, whether it is associated to the means, whether the neighborhood is rich versus poor, and all sorts of things. The third group is environmental ca characteristics, how far it is from any kind of an environmental areas, like maybe landfill areas, maybe uh, some uh, other pollutant sources like that. And there could be some others. So that's the basic mode of typically most people use. I use in, in both cases the same. So this is a regression that I actually ran with the data. I'll be talking about the data a little bit later. These are like the ravines, which is a dummy variable, whether the neighborhood has ravines or does not have ravines. Um, then the public land, median income, age of the neighborhoods, uh, then population density, household size, then the homestead area, which is we commonly call it mod size. Um, then the dwelling area, which is the size of the house, like the square footage, 
and then we also divided the entire city into four quadrants based on like the 1912 division, not like as of now, the entire city is kind of northwest, it's not that division. We divide it in a way that 101 street is the center of north-south, 101 avenue, which is the Jasper Avenue, that's how in fact originally city of Edmonton was designed in, in 1912, so I used that to find out different kinds of quadrants. And then, I use like three southwest, southeast, and northeast, and just to avoid singularity, we have to avoid them, otherwise the matrix will not be inverted. Uh, the others are, are the uh, crime variables, this is sexual assault, non-sexual assault, robbery, break and entry, and vehicle theft. So those are, are the variables that I used. The data I used primarily from four uh, different sources. Uh, I used the name neighborhood data got from the City of Edmonton Assessment and, ta and Taxation Department. They have the neighborhood data. Um, this, this data, is, although it is not really by sale values, but City of Edmonton actually values houses based on um, the what you call market value assessment. Since 1997, City of Edmonton actually adopted that. So my house would be valued based on the houses around my house is being sold, so actually the selling price. The thing is that it's going to be lagged by a year or so, that's, that's the only thing. Otherwise, so it's a sort of broad representation of house prices, that's what I use. Uh, then community profile, City of Edmonton published community profile, and I used 191 mature neighborhoods. I'll be coming and talking about that, why? Uh, the crime data I used from the City of Edmonton Police Service. And the rest of these, like whether the neighborhood is adjacent to a ravine or all these things, that's actually my own observation from the city of Edmonton's official map. So that those are the four sources that I used to get information from. So 192 mature neighborhoods that I used. As of today, if you uh, look at neighborhoods, it's like continuously growing. City of Edmonton is growing so fast, but I used 192. Those neighborhoods are actually older built before 19, uh, 1990 or 2000. So by the time I studied, they are all mature neighborhoods. There are no houses being built. So that's, that's what this. Uh, for, and, and data are available for those neighborhoods. For newer neighborhoods, it's hard to get data from. And also they are stable. And price variability due to separation of lot and house. The newer neighborhoods, if you buy a house, you typically have separate price for lots, separate price for houses, whereas once you go to mature neighborhoods, you buy a house with a lot, so it's one package. So that's another thing. So this is, this, this is the, the result, um, broadly. Um, you will see that there are some variables. When you, if one can see like commonly that, well, if, if a house is adjacent to ravines, on the average, the house is supposed to be sold about $40,000, $41,000 more. This is based on 2008 values. Uh, same thing if you see in uh, southwest, houses are higher values than northeast. Now, one thing that southeast is like $11,000 less. In the northeast, that says uh, $25,000 less. Uh, the other values we serve household areas and median income and the dwelling area, those are positively contributing to the house prices. Those are expected because we expect larger house to be higher prices, higher income people's house to be higher prices, so nothing counter into it. If we go to the crime variables, we don't say none of the crime variables actually contribute significantly to the house prices. And because of that, I ran separately that, well, what if I run a regression without the, um, the crime variables? There are not much differences in terms of the amount of explanation that the regression model gives. Like the adjusted R score is 0 0.8371 versus 0 0.8322. Slight improvement, not much. So that, that tells us that, in fact, crime variable does not impact much on housing prices in our neighbor, in our city. Even though there are some, some studies that say that yes, um, neighborhoods with larger crimes have lower housing prices. So it varies from place to place. 
to the conclusion that I'm saying house prices are significantly affected by adjacency of ravines, of course, positively. Um, how the size of household, size of household means the number of people living in the household. The more number of people live in the household, house prices are high. Don't know why is that, but that's what it is. And the rest of these ones, like size of the lot, area of the house, and household income, those are all positively contributing to the house prices. Those are expected normally. Uh, house prices are not affected by crime here. That one is actually interesting. So what I'm saying that social crimes are more prevalent in low-income neighborhoods, typically like that. But although crime variables in general have negative impact of house prices in Edmonton Harbor, crime variables contribute little to house prices. It may have slightly, but it is not statistically significant. If we go to the next one, the LRT one. Uh, when LRT was being built, the south southern extension went uh, from um, University Station to the Century Park. This study was done before the LRT was built. So we wanted to identify the perception that people have at that point. That was the point when City of Edmonton was doing all the public consultation uh, for L LRT. So what happens in studies when we, we review different literature, some places it says that LRT is going to increase values, some places it says decreases, some people say well increase the value near the station, some places say well decrease the value outside of the station, all sorts of things. So the research was basically mixed. So we wanted to see what people in fact foresee. So what we did from different categories, we picked three different categories within two blocks from the LRT extension idea, what I'm talking about from Belgravia, uh, Macronum, to all the way to, to Century Park. And then second one, two blocks of existing LRT, which was from the north of the stadium station to further north. And the third area we picked, which is completely outside of the LRT, but likely there would be LRT in the future. That's a far future. And we deliberately picked south of uh, Ellerslie Road in uh, Rutherford area, Rutherford, Rutherford area. That's that's what we we did. So our objective was to identify people's perception on the impact of LRT on house prices, people's opinion on the impact of community convenience, impact of social and property crime, whether crime and convenience contribute to the house price or not. That's what. But these are all per se, not real price. Again, the same model. So I'm not going to talk about these. We did this survey, so the south, two blocks around the extended LRT, and the far south, this Rutherford area, and the north area, as they say, we talked about that. Uh, we counted the, the single uh, family houses in the south around LRT within two blocks, 2,150, we distributed 1,200 questionnaires, and we saved 288. Similarly, far south, we received 231. The north, actually, we have not counted the total, but we distributed 197 and received uh, 47. So total response rate was about 40, for, no, about 24%. Uh, the questionnaire contained uh, demographic information, physical characteristics, opinion of the head of the households. We also had another set of questions given by the Edmonton Federation of Community League because we collaborated with the Edmonton Federation of Community League. And we did not analyze those questions. We just had the data and gave it to them. So the conclusion that we found, LRT extension neither improve convenience nor cause any negative externality, as, at least in terms of perception. House prices are expected to increase. Most people responded that house prices are going to increase, but why? They have no idea. Uh, my perception is at that time when City of Edmonton was doing all these public consultation meetings, they were telling that, well, uh, when you built LRT, you are getting more convenience in commuting and your house prices are going to go up. So maybe that might have contributed to that. Um, possibility of improving commuting convenience, but no reduction in, in commuting cost. They thought that was probably commuting might increase. That's it. I think I was with the time. Thanks very much. Okay. All right, once again, we'll just save questions till the end and maybe uh,
here. So I'll just start by introducing the subject of my research. Uh, you can see it growing here in the understory of this Mill Creek Ravine uh, photo. And then you can see it uh, here again. And so I think it's clear um, from this image that this is a serious invasive weed. Um, once it enters a forest ecosystem, it rapidly dominates the native species. It does that not only because it's highly competitive for limited resources, there's also evidence that it secretes chemicals into the soil that actually actively prevent other plants from growing. Uh, so this plant is called garlic mustard. It got its name from its smell and its flavor. It was introduced probably in the mid to late 1800s into the eastern United States as a garden herb by early European settlers. So around 1868, it was located growing wild in Long Island, New York, and subsequently it has spread to 37 U.S. states, which you can see here, as far north as Alaska, and it's now in seven Canadian provinces, uh, including Alberta. And the reason that Alberta is not yet colored in here is simply because it's a very recent invader in our province. Interesting, the plant itself is not very effective at dispersing. So the seeds are very heavy. They tend to fall within a meter or two of the plant. They're not wind distributed. They're not um, water distributed like some other invasive species. However, the seeds, especially if they're a little bit wet, can be sticky and will stick to animals, um, the bottoms of shoes, bike tires, car tires. And so its spread across our continent is almost definitely uh, facilitated by human action. Now, the most effective way to control this weed is old-fashioned hand pulling. So the way that you weed your vegetable garden, um, that's the best way to control it. And if you Google garlic mustard, you will come across photos and advertisements of these volunteer pulls going on all across North America. Um, in the top left, here's a picture of the Huron River Watershed Council organized pull in Michigan. They reported in 2008 and 2009 alone, they pulled 300,000 pounds of garlic mustard. These hand pulls are not going to eradicate this weed. So the goal of the hand pull is really to keep densities low enough that native species have some hope of survival and trying to mitigate the further spread of the weed. Uh, even a single mist plant can add hundreds of seeds back into the soil seed bank and those survive at least 10 years. So these types of efforts are going to be ongoing into the distant future. In Alberta, this is listed as a prohibited noxious weed. And so plants that have this designation are usually weeds that are not yet in Alberta or they've entered Alberta and they're still in such limited area that there's a realistic potential for eradication. This designation also means there is a legal obligation to control it. So when it grows on municipal property, the city is obligated to control it. If it shows up in your backyard, you need to pull it out or you can um, be fined if you don't do so and the city can go in and do it for you. So it was first identified in 2010 in the Mill Creek Ravine. Some of you might be familiar with the Mill Creek Ravine. So 76th Avenue kind of transects that ravine and it was found just north and just south of 76th Avenue in 2010. Um, the area by that point was fairly large. It had probably been there for a while before they detected it. The following year it was also found in a small area of the West Mount <coughs> Ravine um, and I'm showing this right here. So this is quite close to our campus, 104th Avenue is there and Grout Road right there. And then last year, they also found a small patch of plants growing in the Kennedale Ravine that's just off Hermitage Park. The only other location that's known in Alberta outside of Edmonton is St. Albert. So there's a small forest lawn ravine, it's called, uh, that has garlic mustard as well. So I wanted to maybe just take a moment to make a point about why I think this weed being here in Edmonton is such a serious problem. And that has to do with the value of our urban forest in Edmonton. So some of you may be aware or not that Edmonton can boast the longest and one of the largest stretches of urban parkland in all of North America. So Edmonton's commitment to having these natural forests within our urban environment sets us apart from most other cities in North America. Another incredible feature of the Edmonton uh, River Valley or river, ribbon of green as it's sometimes called, you can see it here, 
is that it connects to 14 major ravines, lots of minor ravines, and they're remarkably interconnected. So for recreational users, you can enter the ravine and, and really use the length of it. For our native species, there's corridors for movement. For an invasive species, it also <coughs> has the opportunity then to spread throughout the river valley system relatively unimpeded. And of course, these uh, urban forests that we have here are important homes, not only for plant species, animal species, uh, but they're important for our community and they're used quite heavily by our community. Um, this plant, you know, it, it won't stay in the locations it is, it, it will continue to spread almost definitely. And it's also not going to remain necessarily restricted to Edmonton and areas. So it also puts it threat our other forests throughout Alberta. I initiated a research project in 2013, so this is a very recent area for me of research. I contacted somebody at the city of Edmonton, Daniel Labhan, and was interested in collaborating with him on invasive species. I knew the city was doing some work around this. Uh, and part of this was because in the Bachelor of Science degree, we had our first graduating class in 2012, and I was looking for a new area that had community roots but also would provide opportunities for smaller undergraduate projects. And this really, I think, lent itself to that. So these were briefly our, our research objectives. The first one, we wanted to identify and map new patches of infestation that hadn't been already detected. We wanted to do some more characterizing population dynamics. So this is a, a new region for garlic mustard. Uh, as I mentioned, in Alaska, it's present, so it has been in these colder climates, but there's not very much research about how well it, it grows and survives in that kind of colder climate. Um, and then the third objective is to use DNA markers to try to understand how these different populations are, are related, and that we've just started. So I'll talk just briefly <coughs> about the first two today. So this is the results of our survey, um, and so this was done, Anna Salinas Gonzalez was my biology 498 student, and so she and I decided that we would do a survey of a section of the Mill Creek Ravine. And so just a reminder, so here's 76th Avenue. This large patch right here was known by the city of Edmonton. That was kind of the first patch that they found. They found this, I think, the year after, so right across the street here. Um, and so those were the two patches that were known. And so what we did is, it's called a random stratified transect survey. Basically, we walked the whole length of the ravine and at fixed positions, we went in and we did a 10 meter sweep and we looked for garlic mustard. We found five new patches that are highlighted here. Um, these plants were additionally found by a volunteer, so not part of our survey. Uh, and you can see this one is you know, quite far north. It's almost to White Avenue. And so that, basically fed right back into that control effort because the volunteer we pulled the facility facilitates also targeted these areas in 2013 <coughs> and then last year we went back to those locations that we had mapped and pulled them again. Population dynamics, uh, this weed is a biennial so those of you who aren't familiar it means it requires two growth seasons to carry out its lifespan so here we can see in spring you get the tiny little seedlings germinating as soon as the snow melts. It gets going right away. These are second year plants that have survived over winter and then they flower in their second year and set seed. Seed set is usually around August. So we wanted to quantify survival in both first and second year. Again, these photos, here's our first year survival um, at the beginning of spring and then by the end of spring, they're at this rosette stage. So we set up 15 quadrants for second year survival, 15 quadrants for first year at random locations. Essentially, we went and we counted plants. So we did a lot of sitting on the ground, counting plants every two weeks through the whole summer in the ravine, um, rain or shine. This is our second year, so Anna is setting up these quadrants. This is September of 2013, before snowfall. We relocated the quadrants in after winter, after the snow had melted, and again counted them every two weeks until they had fully flowered and started setting seed. When they started setting seed, we pulled them out before they could distribute that seed, and we counted each seed for each plant. Uh, these are very preliminary, but briefly what we found um, so far, and this will be, this is a first replicate, so this will take three years in total. We'll do it two more times and look at the data, the three replicates. Second year mortality didn't seem significant, so our winter doesn't seem to kill these plants. They seem to have no problem surviving our winter. 
Um, even the first year mortality was a little, we saw some effect, but it was quite low. Interestingly, our numbers were uh, for seed set were very low. So compared to the published literature where averages are in the hundreds, we are finding you know, 20, 30 seeds per plant quite often. And so perhaps that might indicate that even though our winter isn't killing them, it might be slowing them down with respect to fecundity, but I think it's too early to draw any um, conclusions from that. So briefly, I just want to thank uh, my department. So the funding for this often, it, it doesn't cost a lot of money to go <laughs> buy plants. So there was pretty limited funding needed, but we're sorry to go buy quadrant materials. Uh, but what funding we did need was provided by the department through biology 498 fees. So Anna Gonzalez was a 498 student that worked 2013, Danielle Tai 2014, and Sean Harper is working right now on one of the DNA projects. So thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, my topic is on conscious consumerism. Um, and specifically related to uh, product information that has a sustainability angle to them. Uh, the connection to this theme of urban spaces, uh, I'll try and make that connection near the end of this presentation, so the, just bear with me as I kind of get the, the premise for this uh, research uh, communicated to you. Um, there's a few things I want to kind of draw your attention to. One is that uh, most uh, consumers are starting to spend part of their budget uh, online that there's a significant amount of Canadians now that are purchasing online and that the total dollar amount per year has been increasing steadily. Um, and that people are increasingly comfortable doing that. Uh, many of the more popular categories tend to be things like electronics, books, uh, household items, uh, but new categories are being introduced all the time to the point where uh, retailers like Amazon are trying to sell food and groceries online. Um, and a particular note that younger people, 18 to 34, are uh, the most comfortable with this behavior. And then you lose about 10% of people interested in doing, or comfortable doing that uh, for the next kind of decade of, uh, or generation of people past that. They also tend to be the same uh, population of people that are very socially aware and socially conscious around their purchasing decisions. So you couple the fact that people are increasingly comfortable buying things online with this uh, interest in social responsibility and environmental impact of their decisions sets the stage for, for some of the research that I'm doing. It's also put some pressure on companies to develop a strong online presence. And we've seen recently with Target leaving the, the marketplace uh, and other uh, companies that are not being successful, such as Blockbuster, not having a strong online presence factors in to their success in the market. Consumers are wanting to find out the impact of their decisions, of their purchasing decisions. Um, they are interested in the social and environmental issues related to those products that they buy. A large uh, number of people are uh, quite interested in this. This research has a bit of a caveat in that a lot of the survey uh, research that's been done asks people hypothetically, would you want to know how socially responsible, environmentally responsible are the products that you're purchasing? Most people have this social desirability bias behind that and saying, yes, I would like to, but if it would cost me more money and I actually have to pay now, it's hard to, to get to that consequential level of uh, data collection, which is something that I'll highlight at the end of this presentation. The last point I want to bring your attention to is the powerful impact of word of mouth marketing. Just think about your own purchasing decisions and where you got that information. Was it from an advertiser or from a friend or a family member? Word of mouth typically carries a lot of weight in people's decision making. And that is now being reflected online when you are checking out uh, consumer reviews. Other consumers that you might uh, either know or do not know might have a strong influence on whether the type of perception you create about those products and those brands. So bringing all those things together kind of drew me to this one key problem, examining consumer responses 
uh, to product information that's online where there are uh, opportunities for sustainability oriented messages to be communicated uh, coupled with consumer reviews or customer reviews from other people. How does that factor into this kind of increasing uh, dynamic that we find ourselves in as a consumer? The implication on the urban spaces theme is that there are more and more businesses that are conducting business online. Uh, much, much of the success of online businesses are uh, driven by larger companies, larger corporations. For the, the livelihood of a city like Edmonton, where there's a strong uh, small business environment, how do small businesses compete in that online space? The more research that we can do to help support uh, best practice for those small businesses, the better the chance for them to survive in this type of environment to preserve that kind of local economy. And the other side, from a consumer perspective, how can we generate a community of ethical consumers at a local level? That when you want to buy something of an ethical nature, uh, where do you go to do that? For some people, they might go to, this, to the local store. There are a number of them in our city where you, they sell purely these products. But beyond that kind of niche market, for the majority of consumers, where do they go? And if there's a trend towards online business, where do you go to, to buy these type of products? So the one theory that I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail about, but the theory that kind of uh, is the base for a lot of the research that I do, uh, not just in, in business, in marketing, but in other kind of uh, social behaviors, it's called construal level theory. And a very simple explanation of this is to look at how you construe or you perceive the world, and there's two kind of levels in which most people will look at things at a high level and at a low level. And different conditions might prime you to see an event or an object either at a high level or a low level. And the analogy is a forest. So at a very high level, you would see the entire forest. You would see it as one large unit, and you wouldn't notice the details. If you were to look at it from a very low level, uh, you might pay attention to a specific tree in that forest. You might see the details such as the bark or the leaves. But if your perspective was at the high level, you would not pay attention to those details. So there are certain conditions in which uh, we approach our lives and we're walking around with a high level perspective, and at certain other times we're looking at things at a low level perspective. And some of those factors are right here. Temporal distance, so if things are happening further into the future, we tend to look at it at a very high level. If things are very close to us in time, we might start looking at things in a very uh, low level perspective. An example is that uh, if someone were to ask you to commit to something that's happening far into the future, you might be more likely to say yes to the point where you overcommit yourself on those future tasks. If someone were to ask you, can you do something tonight or tomorrow morning, you would have a different perspective in judging that type of question. Uh, spatial distance is another uh, factor here. So uh, physically, if things are happening close to home, you would perceive those events differently than if that same event was happening, say, province uh, over from us. You view the, the details of those events quite differently. Social distance is what we look at in this research. So your relationships with other people. Closer relation versus a more distant relation. If you have someone that potentially is not uh, someone that you really have a close relationship with, to look at uh, that person and whatever their request is at a very high level, and someone that's close to you to look at it at a low level. And I'll give you the examples in our research. And the last one is hypothetical distance. So that basically that describes the probability of something to happen. If it's quite probable for it to happen, then you uh, look at it at a very high level, uh, sorry, at a very <coughs> low level, and if it's un, uh, improbable, then at a high level. So this is the, the conscious consumer study that we ran. And the independent variables that we looked at were how we framed the message about the product. So we showed a screenshot of a uh, product page, something that you would potentially see if you were to go onto Amazon.com. And we used four different uh, sentences here in ways of describing its kind of uh, charitable contribution. And the first one is a societal frame, the second one's an individual frame, the third one is a positive or a gain frame, and the last one is a loss or a negative frame. You can see the slight variations between each of those phrases. What we're interested in looking at was the uh, difference in impact on consumer response. 
We also explored uh, a variation of looking at the consumer reviews. And we didn't have a strong hypothetical or a strong hypothesis around the impact of these, but we were interested in looking at uh, how the America's iconic representations of consumer reviews would be reflected. And basically, what we were uh, predicting were that the societal and the positive frames would elicit a high level construal, and the low level construals would come from the individual and negative frames. And there's theoretical support to, to look at this. How we uh, primed our subjects was in the experiment, they would come into a computer lab and they had to respond to a priming task. We call this the global local task. And basically what they saw were either a series of 36 images uh, that were all global letters. So you would see just the um, H that was made out of S. And the question that you had to respond to was, do you see an H or do you see an L? It's only those two letters that we'd ask you to respond to. So if you saw an H, and basically in the global condition you saw a bunch of letters that looked like H's uh, in the aggregate form, even though they were being consisted of F's. So you saw this 36 times and you have to keep saying you saw an H or you saw an L. Basically priming the subject to, to view things at the aggregate level, at the global level. Some subjects saw the local condition. So again, you see the H's or the L's. And in the local condition, all the H's and L's are the, the mini form. So again, after doing 36 of these, your, your mind gets honed in on that, the small details. So we, we primed our subjects to look at the global or the local um, prime, and then we showed them the screenshots of the various products that we tested. And again, we buried the statement down here, and we buried the customer review box over there. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the data to share with you today. We're in the midst of analyzing that data. We were able to collect over 2,000 um, uh, samples uh, to support this research. And, I'm planning to share this data at an event through the School of Business on March 20th. Uh, what we we're hoping to do is to re reveal the results of the data. The dependent variables that we collected on uh, were a number of them, but some of them I want to highlight was a consumer's interest in buying that product, uh, whether their perceptions of the product are positive or negative, the perceptions of elements within that page to the consumer review box, and then more importantly for us, perceptions of the charitable reputation that company or the seller had when we buried these things uh, between consumers and how much they thought was actually being donated through uh, the sale of that product. Uh, and our predictions would suggest that uh, interest perceptions from consumers would be greater when they were primed at the low level and uh, perceptions and estimate, estimates of charitable donations would be greater when they were primed at the high level. The, the argument being that the first three uh, dependent variables are very much uh, self-oriented uh, responses, whereas the last two are more uh, other-oriented for, for the benefit of the community. What we hope are the implications of this is that uh, suggesting different types of messages to work in different uh, impact levels for the consumer and for the seller. That we can recommend to the seller to frame certain things in certain ways to perceptions of what your product is more and to consider how to improve perceptions of your charitable components and to reinforce the fact that the priming conditions can actually work to support uh, that these manipulations of the phrases that we're using are true that they actually do carry some weight in how we market uh, different products <coughs> so as I said we're going to complete the data analysis but there's a more of, a, of an applied tool that this research is trying to set up. We're trying to create a, an actual application to collect real world data. So in this setting, it was very uh, experimental. We've been working uh, through uh, the computer science department and some design study students to create an actual app that would allow consumers to uh, review and comment local businesses and local products that are being sold here, and to share that information with each other to generate the community. Uh, similar in, in nature like uh, Yelp and TripAdvisor and Urban Spoon, other kind of consumer oriented review sites, uh, but to really feature sustainability information in those sites. And so there's a couple of screenshots of some of the work that the design students have uh, generated for prototyping <coughs> this, uh, this app. 
So the research has really started off uh, from a marketing perspective, but it has some interdisciplinary connection with uh, design students and computer science students. It's an ongoing project with the ultimate goal of releasing an app uh, that can be used by consumers uh, in Edmonton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, now uh, we have some time for questions. Shelly, I think you had a question, but there are several questions now. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll just, um, Leo, before I forget, um, there's been uh, some information lately that I, I've become aware of where the reviews were for sites or products, they actually hire people to write those reviews. So they're not actually legitimate, regular consumer reviews. Right. So, so you're sort of targeting going towards um, not being a review, but being um, an advocate or an informant of how how green these things are, how can, how uh, sustainable they are. How can we be sure that we believe you? Like how how are you going to show that that this is like real research that we can rely on, and that it's not just another thing like people are hired to to convince us that this is uh, maybe true. Yeah, I think the trust. Worthiness yeah. of a site uh, is always going to be in question, and yeah. it plays into the policies that you have in terms of moderation and approval and enforcing uh, uh, the, the user policies. Mm -hmm. uh, there's certain things that are just going to be very difficult to prevent from happening mm -hmm. from uh, someone being uh, incentivized to go say a positive review, even if they didn't have an actual positive experience. Right. It's hard to uh, to avoid those situations, but you can uh, minimize those situations from happening, from, sure. have, from having strong policies. And the other part here is that, not just the reviews, but uh, we're setting this up as an academic community project. It's not a, uh, a for-profit initiative, whereas some other sites are for-profit, and they may be presenting reviews or uh, elevating the positive reviews for businesses that have paid a subscription to that service, for example. We're trying to separate, uh, create kind of that's a firewall around the payment. Yeah. Uh, and could, is it possible for you to quickly give me an example of, um, you said, um, like from a marketing perspective, of a global, uh, kind of a global priming for, for something? Um, so how do you get someone to think of, kind yeah. of top down? Yeah, so it can even be the kind of the, the initial screen in which you arrive at, at, at an app and the kind of initial message that you see. Mm -hmm. So uh, the easiest one for most people to understand is maybe not with an app, but say you uh, walk into a doctor's office. And for most people who go and visit their doctor, they are somewhat sick. And so their goal is to uh, eliminate the sickness or to, to address their illness mm -hmm. versus the positive goal-oriented approach, which is to become healthier. They're very much the same thing, but a different perspective on it. Mm -hmm. And so to get someone to be more goal-oriented when you're in the doctor's office, in the waiting room, for example, messaging that you see around uh, the time uh, expectation of waiting, changing those factors can get someone to look at it from a goal perspective instead of from that uh, loss perspective. <coughs> Uh, for the team on the high level bridge project, um, first off, I'm interested in how you're going to measure success effectiveness of this initiative. <laughs> I mean, suicide rates are known, and you can do forever, for now, future, but specifically if your initiative had an impact, how do you plan to evaluate that? Well, first of all, that's a very non fine art question because in <laughs> fine arts, we don't measure success with a ruler, right? It's a, in fact, it's a problem. It's something we need to do, figure out as artists. But we are in touch, we are collaborating with the city task force for suicide prevention. So that's a group of people, including police officers, who put up that telephone. And so they will, I hope, get back to us. And remember though that we have moved away from direct suicide prevention as a goal of the project because we were afraid that that would actually, um, what's the word for it, you know, re have the opposite effect. And so it's a community building project. How do you measure community building? 
So, so my second question is specifically to the way you're going and going about the sandblasting it into the slide marks. Um, something I've seen like 10 months of the year <laughs> exaggeration are slide marks are iced over. So that um, seems to me that would have some diminished effect as a result. I think that's fantastic because once you have an artwork that has no life, you know, people just ignore it, right? Mm -hmm. It's just there and nobody <coughs> sees it anymore. I think if it has an actual life where it, parts of the words are appearing through the snow, I, I, to me that's a part of it. So, so finally, I'm, I'm somewhat interested in how much consideration in what your, the specific message you're putting out was given to the typical users of the, of the walkways, the bridgeways, the non-suicide intent mm -hmm. people, which we hope is the vast majority. Was any consideration given to the, that audience in devising the messages? I'll let Kathleen answer that. Um, well, I think we decided to focus on the Braemar students and uh, use their, uh, you know, their creativity and their expression. So we never went to other populations. Too. Was the nature of the messages, the actual specific wording, was what other people would, how they would interpret it, given the consideration when you were still they were being selected? Or just strictly the idea of discouraging people from taking It was more, um, you know, giving positive messages, sort of an uplifting message was kind of the exercise given to the teenagers. Mm -hmm. I asked the teens literally to I asked them, what would you say to a friend who was really sad? What would you say to them to help them go through difficulties in life? How would you uplift them? And that's not something that's <coughs> specific to people who are about to commit suicide. I mean, I think I'm a really happy person, but I have bad days, you know? So the idea behind this is that it's the exact reverse of graffiti. Normally you see graffiti, it says F you. This is graffiti that says, I care about you. Great, thanks. If I could just make an observation to that question, I would think as a person who's not, not normally too depressed, <laughs> um, it would increase my sensitivity about if I knew the reason why those, those things are there and when I'm walking back and forth and it would make me reflect on what would cause the person to actually jump off this bridge or, or what, um, what kind of situation might they be in. So I would think it would increase the community's sensitivity to those kinds of stigma. Yes, good point. But, yeah, so, uh, so I, I would think that it would definitely have a big impact on the rest of the community. If, is that a good question? I would like to ask too, um, how many submissions did you get from the, the school? Um, we worked with, I think in total, about six or seven classes. You see, I went back to the school a couple of times. That's why it's hard anymore to count. But each class, there were about um, 20 girls. It's all girls. And each one of the girls submitted, on average, about four. So you guys are good at this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and what did you, how many did you actually take that are going to be sent Is it just... One. Only 14, partly 14. because I've run out of money. Um, the grant only goes so far. It's $300 to sandblast each one of these little things. And we're not being paid at all. We're volunteers for the project. And, does, and this will be there till basically, I don't know, till it falls down or something? There's no plan for the city to re-sandblast it and make it disappear or anything? Like well, it should last as long as Rome. <laughs> <laughs> and I find that really interesting as a piece of art that's, I don't know, that, that there's sort of permanent, permanent text there, permanent reflections. They'll be very subtle. I don't know if, if you don't know that they're there, you might not actually see them. Mm -hmm. Because I, we don't plan to paint them. The idea is that it's a very, um, you really have to watch when you're walking. We hope that it's a, a bit of a surprise. You might have walked there. You might walk past them many times, and then suddenly, oh! Because that, that bridge gets a lot of use. A uh, huge running bridge, and mm -hmm. people Bikes just traverse and over yeah. it, and to get from one side to the other, to go to A or to come the other way. So wow, it's going to get a lot of uh, good excitement. Wow. When I travel to <coughs> Ireland, because I've taken uh, student groups there on study tours, uh, when you walk, I don't know whether anybody's been in Dublin, uh, but when you walk the streets of Dublin, they have poetry 
in brass, and I love that. You know, you're walking mm -hmm. along, and it's <laughs> they love their writers in television. Heather, you had a question. I'm just wondering about um, sort of the knowledge mobilization piece, and if you have documented either you know in, in text or video the process of working with students and what that was like for them in terms of their own reflections and transformation in making this piece of public art and contributing to it because there's a community there as well that I think needs to be celebrated. You know very much a part of this was the idea that the process is a part of the artwork. You're absolutely right, but I don't know if any of you have worked in schools, getting permission and consent forms and videotaping, it's an absolute nightmare. So we kept the submissions anonymous and we tried to go through the least um, bureaucratic problems. You know, even principals, if I, if I go too far, like I say we're gonna be videotaping this, we might have not had permission. Because, I mean, the essence of community-based research is exactly that. It's creating that community building and social change movement within the group that extends beyond. Why don't you come with us next time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally serious. You know, we're, we're in fact, uh, the reason I have to put money into my parking meter is because we want to do a project, yeah. I'm hoping, in Boyle Street Community Services to collect stories from marginalized people. If you want to do that with us, <laughs> and I, I, we're completely interested. <laughs> the students will be invited, though, when we quietly unveil. We're not having a big public event, but they will be invited. All right, well, in the interest of um, my, my role here in terms of curriculum, I have to ask you all, now it came through in some of your presentations, but I'm curious about curricular application of your research. You know, you highlighted students, you highlighted um, <coughs> sharing this project with the design studies class. Maybe if you could each just take a minute and talk about whether or not your projects have had any kind of impact on your curriculum within your courses, that would be really helpful. So for you it was 498. Right, so 498 is an independent study course, so those students certainly, I mean, they carried out projects, they designed protocols, they wrote up results, gave for so that is quite easy. This past year, I also teach our introductory botany course. Um, botany is a, a difficult course to teach in Alberta because any opportunity to get out in the field, it's running, there's snow on the ground and all the plants are dead. Um, but we have a window in September and this year for the first time we did for the first lab, we went out, uh, we had a field trip literally around McEwen where the students did weed collections. Um, and they pressed the leaves, they had to identify them, um, they had to give presentations, <coughs> research them and give presentations in class. Uh, and I was amazed by the impact it had on students. So usually the first lab, they sit at microscopes, they look at pressed, dried, but to actually get out, and they were literally just in the Denny's parking lot outside, it, it had a real impact on this term. And, and invasive species can be used as a way to talk about basic botany concepts, so it's informed my teaching in that way. Um, this specific research wasn't done uh, with a, strong, a direct connection with the course, uh, but I have something very similar to this research, uh, again based on the same theories, but focused on uh, environmental behaviors, and that research has used an independent study uh, student and uh, again in collaboration with computing science students where they did it as part of a course project. Uh, so there's a number of, uh, the interdisciplinary side is really interesting and uh, but challenging to line up mutual interests and, and scheduling and those kind of things. But, yeah, it's, it's definitely a win-win situation. Thank you. So for me, the, the first project, the neighborhood characteristics, I had a summer student who actually went through the entire map of identifying all the neighborhoods and which one was adjacent to the ravines and which one is not and, and all those things. Uh, the second one, uh, the LRT project, the entire data were collected actually three of our uh, third year econ major students. Mm -hmm. So they collected the data, they entered the data into the computer, and virtually we run the program, but after running the program, they also know the result and we shared with them so they understand what eventually we got it. And uh, in fact, all those, those things eventually generated a project, uh, sorry, a course, on urban economics. I don't know if it's in the calendar now, 
the low end of the offering and fees are something like twelve fifty. That's great. And you know, um, undergraduate research has been identified as a high impact educational practice. So, mm -hmm. Training future researchers uh, doesn't necessarily mean they'll go into research fields, but it does have a huge impact on their ability to absorb materials. So, excellent. Thank you. Uh, how about your project? I know you involved Braemar, but was there any involvement of it curricularly from McEwen? No, I, I, I'm, we have, I think it's just more what we've learned. Um, the social work program. Uh, we do a two-day workshop for all of our first-year students on suicide awareness. So the information that we gained from this is just incorporated into that workshop. We also do a new workshop um, on for the LGBT community, uh, which is a, a high-risk area for suicide. Uh, so mainly what we're doing is just increasing our awareness, educating people, and then uh, for me, just talking about art as a as a way of helping people heal from trauma uh, and how to uh, deal with crisis. So using it in our methods classes, our family, uh, so it's more informed my teaching and, and that, of course I'm chair, so don't do a lot of teaching, so I'm uh, supervising and, and giving direction to the other faculty. And one of the reasons that I showed you the background to this project is that to a large extent, uh, we didn't work with our students in this project, but in general, these projects lend themselves to student involvement. And so, if, you know, all the past projects have been with students, and this is actually the only one that students weren't involved in. But we do discuss it in class, and I'm hoping to build on that. And the next projects we're looking at, Right. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Heather, you had a yeah. I just have sort of a question for everyone or anyone. Mm -hmm. um, which um, uh, a number of universities have been moving more into doing these kinds of things and actually have identified particular structures or um, you know certificate embedded certificate programs or those kinds of things that students can be involved with, whether it's community-based research or simply applied research or whatever that might be. Do you see that as an opportunity for McEwen? Because I, I know students love being on the field. It means a lot. They learn a lot. It's very applicable to jobs. Um, can you see us at McEwen trying to move more into that direction? Or do you think that independent study approaches are, are working OK? See, I, I, in, from my perspective, I think uh, independent study and community service learning, those are two different things that I see. Mm -hmm. uh, from my perspective, we started using, we don't call it independent study, I would rather call it individual study. Like when we started first small majors, we suppose one student needs a particular course that he or she needs to graduate, but he or she is the only one. Then we offer one particular faculty from his or her interest of these and, and they then do a course so that can finish his or her degree. That was the purpose. As opposed to, I think, community service learning, it's, it's a completely different thing with the student will be uh, actually working in the field to integrate that experience into his or her academia. So these these are these are two two different things. That's what I said. Yeah, I think I, would feel, I don't see it as being service learning as much as a okay. research project mm -hmm. that work, that goes <coughs> that that gets sort of maybe rather than being an individual or independent study mm -hmm. um, gets actually some um, placement within your faculty mm -hmm. as being something that is really considered important. To yeah, one of the things that we have in our program, there are some, some students that we place with the government of Alberta. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it field placement. Mm -hmm. So for one semester, they work with one faculty member in our department and another individual with the government of Alberta. Most of the time, either Alberta Environment or Alberta Sustainability or Finance Department, somebody. Uh, they would be working with, with a certain project, based mostly they are there for two, two hours per week or one hours per week based on their arrangement that they make it. And at the end of the semester, they get a letter from the supervisor uh, in the ministry. And of course, they're also getting a 
a recommendation from the faculty member. A faculty member, in fact, will be submitting a pass-fail grade. We don't grade it as A, B, C, D like that. I would say, I, I think they're really important. I hope that we continue to support them and provide more opportunities. Um, I've just had my first USRI student where they get their own little pot of money that you can pay them with and use. Uh, that is such a great opportunity um, because it can be difficult to, not all students want to take it as a course. They mm -hmm. might not have room in their semester or they might have concerns about basically doing work over the summer, which is their time to earn money to try to offset their student loans or debt accumulation. Um, those opportunities are, are really great and I hope we support them. But we have to support faculty as well. I mean, the, the flip side of that is it's wonderful to mentor students. Um, it's incredibly time consuming. You know, as you know, it's not considered part of your teaching load. It's something you, you take on in addition to and uh, certainly, I think in our department, the limiting factor is, is just faculty time. Yeah. Any other questions for our faculty presenters? Can I just ask, uh, Melissa, so is, is one of your goals in this research on the uh, garlic mustard um, to eradicate it, or, or is it more observational of <laughs> yeah. how it's going? <laughs> I don't think it's possible to eradicate it in Albert. I mean, it could be possible, but there'd have to be such a dr dramatic shift. The resources aren't there right now to eradicate it. Um, no, you know, Michael really, I, I certainly would like research interests that somehow might inform control, uh, but really the research is quite basic. Just can we understand more? And I mean, I think from that fu fundamental kind of science question, can we understand more about this organism in this environment? You certainly hope that somehow through understanding it more, it might feed back into controlling it or, or even maybe eradicating it, I don't know. But um, I suppose really, my, if I had to be completely honest, that yes, on a grant I would say, let, this information <laughs> might help us to eradicate it, but in reality, it's more about just understanding more, and, and maybe through understanding even this invasive species, we learn more about others, right? So I guess I, through the survey, we try to help with the control effort through the population biology. Um, it just adds to the literature that's there in our understanding. Uh, can I ask a quick question to Shiki? Mm -hmm. um, Shiki, why did you choose um, um, the, the variable of crime for rise and fall of housing. Like I could maybe understand that if we were in, I don't know, I hesitate to choose a city, but, but a city that's more well known for that. What what was your interest in choosing? Well, there, there are actually literature that suggests that housing price does get affected by crime rates in the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things, that's what I wanted to see, that is it really true for Edmonton or not? Because okay. the research is not conclusive. Some places they say yes, some other places they say no. So that's, that's one reason. The other reason is when the city of Edmonton was doing all this public consultation uh, during the LRT extension period, there were concerns from um, many different uh, people around uh, the LRT line that while well, LRT line is going to, you know, going to be increase the commuting of low income people or um, people who commute or, or contribute to social crime and all those things. So those are kind of negative externalities they were thinking in, in, in their mind. Mm -hmm. So there are all, all, all sorts of things. Where the city of Edmonton was trying to convince that no, because of increasing commute um, <coughs> or commuting convenience, the housing prices are going likely to increase. And, and there are in fact many places that housing prices, prices do increase, particularly around the stations. In, in many places in Europe, particularly where the population is pretty dense. And the other thing, uh, City of Edmonton, even when, when this, the LRT was first built, uh, most people thought that it's not going to be viable. Uh, the same problem uh, was identified when the LRT was extended. And that's why you would still see that even if you want to get into LRT, you will see a big line up. Because people did not anticipate that the ridership will be so much. Mm -hmm. That did not anticipate. Because typically, uh, light rails are viable where population density is really, really high. 
but city of Edmonton is pretty sparse. Population density is relatively low, and most people like to drive cars and vans and all those things. But still, there are people they like to like to ride in. Thank you. I, now I'm much more clear on your connection with the. Okay, one more question. I'm just looking to you, uh, Shelly Salt. So when you look at the crime, do you look at the number of crimes or do you look at the type of crimes? How do you look at the crimes? Number and type. Like if, if you see that uh, break and entry, vehicle theft, and then sexual assault and non-sexual assault. Mm -hmm. So those are the categories of crimes. Number of crimes by neighborhoods. Okay, so as a whole? As a whole for okay. the whole year, for one okay. year. Okay, so you didn't look at Yeah, not like one particular incidence, right. but it's it's the number of crime happened in the neighborhood and the average housing price in the neighborhood. And That's what I mean. Were you able to get that information from the Edmonton Police Service? Right. The Edmonton Police Service used to post that in their website. Now they don't do it uh -huh. because people may think that, well, housing price might get affected and this and that. So <laughs> I, I used to ask Edmonton Police Service at that time and got all those information from there. So there are two places they actually help me. One is Edmonton Police Service, the other one is the City of Edmonton Assessment and Taxation Department. Well, I think we're out of time. So a couple of things I'd like to mention before we thank our presenters once again. That is, if you are interested in applying for one of the strategic research grants, uh, do talk to the research office. If you're more interested in learning more about um, sustainability, we have a sustainability faculty learning community that meets once a month here in CAFE, uh, started up by David Cannon. And um, if you're interested, uh, Heather mentioned um, community engagement. If you're interested perhaps in service learning or community engagement, we do have another faculty learning community that meets on one Friday a month here in CAFE. So feel free to um, check the programming guide. We have lots of programming guides here, so help yourselves. Um, so please join me in uh, thanking the presenters once more. Thank you.